Let's create a really nice wind shader for our foliage. Then let's take it a step further and have our player's velocity affect the foliage. This is not done using animations, we're going to do this by directly manipulating the shader itself. Doing it this way is a lot more performant and it gives us a lot more control as well. Ready? Let's go. And yes, I admit this is not grass, it's algae, but it's the first thing I found for free on the asset store and it works just fine and I'll link it down below in case you're interested. Now let's create a new sprite lit shader graph and open it up. So whenever you deal with sprites and shaders, you want to first create a texture 2D property, which will grab the sprite from the sprite renderer. So we name it main text always and sample that out. And in order to get our sprite to show up as it should, we just need to plug in the RGBA to the base color and the alpha to the alpha. Now, what we're looking to do here is offset the position of the sprites vertices and sprites do have vertices. If you go into the inspector, you can click this draw mode button here and change it to wireframe. And now you'll be able to see the vertices of our sprites. So in your sprite import settings, we want to make sure for this shader that our sprites use a tight mesh type, because if we change it to full rect, you lose all those vertices. So back in our shader, in order to offset the position, let's add a position node and change it to object space. Now, I'm only really interested in changing the x-axis of the vertices. Things can look pretty weird when we touch the other axes. So to just use the x-axis, let's split this position node. And I know that these letters are for color data, but you can also think of them as x, y, and z. So the r is going to be x. So let's add some amount to this so that we can control it. And then bring it all back together again with a combined node and plug that output into the position node. And you can see as we add to the X, we move the sprite around just on the X axis. So in order to move individual vertices around, let's add a gradient noise node and plug that into the add node here. And as that moves around, you can see the start of a wind effect happening. Now we want to be able to kind of scroll through this noise and almost any time that we want to scroll through things, we use a time node for that. So let's plug that into the offset of a tiling and offset node, which is the easiest way to scroll things in a shader. This offset is just a vector two, so we are offsetting the X and the Y, but remember we set this up in such a way that it only affects the X in the end. Now plug this into our gradient noise UV input. So this is looking pretty terrible right now, so let's slow this down and fix it up a little bit. And the first thing that I want to fix is the fact that this sprite is just kind of leaning towards the right too much. That's because this is all happening in UV space, and UV space goes from 0 to 1, meaning 0 0.5 is the center. So to center this, let's subtract 0 0.5 from the gradient noise. Next, this is actually the perfect place to control the intensity of the wind, so let's add a float and make it a slider between 0 and 5, and default it to 0 0.5 and let's hook that back up. If we multiply this, it'll make it darker. Anything white on here will move the vertices, anything black will not. That's why if we make it zero, it does nothing, and if we crank it up, it goes completely nuts. All right, so let's create another float called wind scale and make it a slider between zero and 10, and we'll use a default of 0 0.5, which looks pretty good. Now let's plug that into the scale of our gradient noise, which is really going to tone this down and make it look a lot nicer. I would also like to be able to control the speed of this scrolling, so let's create another float called wind speed, and let's also make that a slider between 0 and 5, and we'll default that to 3, and multiply that by the time, and plug that into offset. So we're nearly done here, but the biggest problem I have left with this is that it's moving uniformly. And realistically, let me swap this for something that doesn't hang. We want the bottom to be anchored to the ground and only affect the top area. So we want to be able to mask this out. And to do that, let's add a UV node. And let's split this out so that we can access individual axes. We only care about looking at top to bottom, so the y-axis, which is the green. And to visualize it, let's drag that into a preview node. So now we want to combine this with this finished result here. So let's multiply those together. And you can see now it's nicely anchored to the ground. 
but it would also be nice to have some control over this mask. So let's drag that out into a power node and create a new float called Y mask influence, make it a slider between zero and four, and let's default it to one. Now you can plug that into the power node and let's plug this in here. And actually in my scene, I do have some plants that hang from the ceiling as well. So I'd like to be able to use this same shader. So let's add a bool property here called mask from bottom and I'll default this to true. And let's drag that into a branch node. So if this Boolean is true, then we'll use this. And if it's false, we'll flip this by dragging it into a one minus node. And now you can see if we uncheck this, the top is gonna stand still. We're just about done. We just need one more float called external influence. This is the value we'll actually change when our player walks past the grass. Let's make it a slider between negative five and five and default it to one because this is a multiplier. And even though we just made it a slider, we're going to be modifying this from a script and so we still need to clamp it. And we'll do that by the same values as the slider. And now we'll multiply that with the same 0.5 we had in there before. So nothing visibly changes, but now if we drag the external influence over, you can see that it moves in a specific direction. All right, let's check this out in our scene view. Let me go ahead and create two copies of a material for the shader, one for the ground plants and one for the hanging plants. Oh, and by the way, if you want your scene view to be nice and smooth with your shaders, just check this option right here. So one of the first things you might notice is that all the plants are animating exactly the same and it looks really, really unnatural. So let's fix that. Literally all we need to do back in our shader is add a position node that is in world space and drag that into our UV in the tiling and offset. There we go. That's looking much better. The next thing you might notice is that especially by dragging up the intensity, you can get really, really bad looking results. And what this has to do with is your number of vertices on the sprite. For example, let's just crank this up to like three. We can give it much better looking results by giving it more vertices. Okay, so let's open that sprite up in the sprite renderer and go down to skinning editor and select auto geometry. If you don't have the skinning editor, someone correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, please, but I believe you need to install the 2D animation package. So we can crank up the outline detail, which is going to add more vertices around the edges, and we can crank up the subdivide as well, which will do exactly what it sounds like and subdivide it, just giving us more vertices overall. Click generate for all visible to see how it looks. Cool, so let's try that. Hit apply. There you go. A whole lot less stretching and weird crap compared to what we had. Though I do think this intensity is a little bit high, so let's drop it down to one. You can see the difference really well when you turn wireframe mode back on again. Okay, so let's get it moving based on our character's velocity. First, I'm going to just add more vertices to all of my sprites. All right, there we go. So I'm going to place all of those inside an empty game object called grass. And on this game object, we're going to add a script called grass velocity controller. And let's open that up. Here are all the variables we'll need for that script. Pause if you need to. We're going to use these in our next script, but this acts as a strength multiplier for the external influence because we want to be able to control how strong it looks. And we'll be easing the grass in and out of its new position, so these are the times for that. And here's the threshold for how high the velocity needs to be before it'll actually take effect at all. And we've assigned the shader property to an integer, keeping in mind that this is the exact spelling from the reference in the shader right here. Next, we're going to set up a method where we pass in the material and the player's velocity and set the external influence of that material based on the player's velocity. Okay, now before we continue, let's add some trigger box colliders to our grass objects.
And on all of them, let's add a script called grass external velocity trigger. Now in that script, here are all of the variables that you're going to need. And we are initializing some of them in the start method. And again, you can pause if you need to. I'm going to start first by creating our ease in and ease out coroutines and only our ease in needs a velocity parameter. So for ease in, let's make sure that we track when they're running. And while our elapsed time is less than our ease in time, we'll iterate our timer, set up a float, and lerp it from the starting velocity of the grass to the velocity that we pass in. And we'll divide elapsed time by the ease in time so that it syncs up perfectly. And here we'll call that influence grass function from our other script, passing in this material and the lerped amount we just created. And the ease out coroutine works exactly the same, except we need to grab the current x influence at the beginning. And for this, we're lerping from the current x influence back to the starting velocity and make sure we're using our ease out time, not our ease in time. All right, great. So we're going to need an on trigger enter 2D, an on trigger exit 2D, and an on trigger stay 2D function. In the enter, we want to check if it's the player, and if it is, we want to run the ease in coroutine, passing in the player's velocity, multiplied by our external influence strength. But we only want to do that if our coroutine isn't already running, and our player's velocity is greater than our threshold. And we're using mathf.absolute so that it doesn't really matter whether the numbers are positive or negative. If they're negative, it'll just turn them positive. In our on trigger exit 2D, again, check if it's the player. And here we just call the ease out coroutine. Now, in our on trigger stay 2D, which runs every frame that we are within the trigger, first we want to calculate what our velocity was last frame. And we simply do this by keeping it at the end of the function. So if we were over the threshold last frame, but now we are not, it means that we've slowed down enough that we don't want to be affecting the grass anymore. So let's call the ease out coroutine. Otherwise, if we were under the threshold last frame, but now we are over the threshold, then we've sped up enough that we want to be affecting the grass. So we're gonna call the ease in coroutine, passing in the X velocity multiplied by the external influence multiplier. And for the rare occasion that things align for like a single frame where they might get stuck, we'll say if the coroutines aren't running and we're currently within the velocity threshold, then just call the influence grass method. All right, let's see how this looks. There you go, a really nice wind shader that is affected by your character's velocity. Like the video if you liked, and I know there's all sorts of room for improvement with this. Let me know what you do with this project differently down below in the comments. I would love to hear about all the improvements that you guys make to this and what kinds of crazy things you end up doing with it. If you want access to the shader or the code, my patrons get access to the source files of every tutorial. So head on over there if that sounds interesting to you. Bye. I want to give a very special thank you to all of our Hall of Fame patrons, Jakob Yondok, Zondra Kessler, Darren Preen, Throbbing Wind, Fontaine Waite, Couch, and Christopher Nichols, as well as our early access patrons, Zayoma, Ken Waite, Mason Crow, Mr. D, Audio Games, Yon, Donnie Briggs, Alexander Prestes, and Darren Cook. If you choose to support us on Patreon, you can get early access to all of our YouTube videos, monthly alpha builds, and more.